that is Mr. Chris Davey, and he's out in uh, Southern California. So, Mr. Davey, how are you doing today? Splendid, buddy. Thank you. Uh, absolutely splendid. Any better, I would be you. Oh. <laughs> I don't think you want to be me. <laughs> <laughs> Pam told me well, she was my... my wife doesn't want me to be me either. So, <laughs> 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 trying to trying to trying to do all this crazy stuff. Oh, for our listeners, Miss Chris Austin is off today, and she'll be off next week. She's out on some personal business, and uh, and uh, she's actually visiting her mother, and I think that's a good thing a daughter should do. So uh, we wish her well, and uh, we'll see her back here in another two weeks. So just everybody doesn't have to freak out that she's not here anymore. No, she is. She's just uh, doing some stuff with her mom, and I think that's a good thing. So, Chris, how's the weather out there in Southern California? Uh, today was perfect. Yesterday was perfect. I think the next week is going to be perfect. So, uh, yeah, awesome. There's a little load that's going to come through on the weekend and dip the temperatures a bit. Might get some of that uh, night and early morning low clouds with a little bit of mist and drizzle that comes out of them, but nothing significant, Rob. And, uh, you know, I have family there in the Phoenix area as well, so I watch the weather there. It's going to be good for you guys. A little cooler on the weekend. Yeah, it's going to be 92 today. <clears throat> Uh, it's just, uh, 89 at this moment, but it rises a little bit more. So we'll probably get 92 degrees by tonight. It it cools down and nice. We get like I like I've always said, we get a nice breeze by the mountains here every afternoon, and uh, that makes it a nice cool night. Leave the windows open, get some fresh air at night, and it's uh, just kind of a wonderful thing. So have you have you had your have you had your first 100 degree day yet? Yes, we did last week actually. Oh, last week. Okay. Yeah. Last week, and it was. Uh, but you know, used to the, used to used to that temperature. I'm not going to say used to the heat. Um, you know, we have a home that's air conditioned. We have a car that's air conditioned. We go to the stores that's air conditioned. You know, so, so you know, what am I out like thirty seconds when I park the car and walk into something? It's it's not that bad at all. It's pretty. Do it's you pretty have nice. Do you have a remote start on your car so you can get it going and get it nice and cooled off by the time you? Uh, Pam has it on hers, but she never puts yeah. it on. She never yeah. puts it on. I, yeah. I always, she worries that somebody can steal the car when the car's running, so she doesn't uh, she doesn't bother yeah. doing it. And you had a little bit of wind too of the beginning of this week, I think, or uh, my my daughter in in uh, Phoenix was telling me not not a Scirocco, right? Not one of no. those those wind storms that have the big you know big forceful brace of uh, dust and crap and a boob, a boob. Yeah, that's yeah. it. No, we didn't have that. It was it was windy here. And uh, I think I told you last week I had to pick up a whole bunch of uh, uh, Palo Verde uh, yellow little flowers awesome. off this tree. Yeah, and I filled the trash can up uh, that day and, and did it again today. And it was it was just a hassle. It's just you know I think it's beautiful trees, but it gets all over. I mean my whole my whole <laughs> lawn and everything driveway is all yellow. Not anymore. I, I took care of that early this morning. So hey, there's an article I thought might be an interesting topic for us today and. And I don't know, you've been reading and, uh, you know, as state legislatures convene across the country, you know, a lot of issues affecting agriculture community and well as others are at the forefront of legislation. And and what they're trying to do is they want to see something called the right to repair. And what that means is the right to repair movement built with uh, the concept that consumers and independent repair businesses should have equal access to manufacturers materials for equipment repair has gained momentum and across the sectors and blah, 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 blah. And, and, you know, uh, according to the Repair Association in New York, the movement has found a significant battleground in agriculture where some farmers seek autonomy over repairing their machinery. Now, we can apply that also to the landscape business. So let's, let's kind of yeah. look at, let's start it off at the, at the landscape business. Now, we, we had a customer, or we have customers that use our controllers, irrigation controllers. And one of them uh, was using them for uh, watering down solar panels. Instead of having sprinklers on their ground, they have it on the roof to wash down the, the solar panels so they stay clean and can generate more heat. Well, in so doing that, when they had come to our, our facility one time to talk about some nozzles and things, they were telling me that they moved the transformer that's inside the box to another location inside the box. And that's forbidden by... Uh, underwriters laboratory the ul because you know they rate the unit for electrical uh, uh safety and make sure there's no fires and things those people people moving those things really shouldn't do that um you know i have a a, a lighting transformer that has a, a, a plug-in little timer that goes in 
So instead of having from dusk to dawn, which is, which most of those do, you, you can buy these little uh, adapters to stick in as a timer, and you plug it directly in and set the time. I want it to come on at 7 o'clock at night and go off at 11 o'clock at night. Well, those things, if they break, I have no problem with people taking them apart. But if something breaks on the transformer itself, I would highly recommend nobody touching it. Yeah. <laughs> because most of them are sealed. Yeah. And and, so, and, and, and going into the and, – and, and we had a company – uh, actually, it was a water district, and I won't mention who it was, but years ago, several years ago, probably about eight to ten years ago, they put a bid out for 1,200 controllers to be put uh, smart controllers to be put in their district, and they were going to give them away to customers and, and see how they work to reduce uh, to water. So um, they actually took, because the, it, was, it was, I can't mention the city because you'll know who it is, um, they have a regular fire regulation that everything has to be UL approved, Okay. Uh, any kind of office machinery, anything you plug into your house has to have the UL certification. Well, they found out that at least out of the 1,200, I think there was, I said four earlier, but I think it was closer to seven or eight caught on fire. Now, imagine you have a house, and I know you have a two-story house, for example, and and you have something, a room above your garage, correct? I believe. Yes. Okay. Correct. I, I didn't go upstairs, so I, I wasn't sneaking around, stuck in your yeah, bathroom yeah. upstairs or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, imagine imagine a family who has kids living up, you know, in the bedroom upstairs, and they're sleeping at night, and all of a sudden this thing catches on fire, t- t- torches the garage, and goes up up through the house and kills the kid. So the water agency called me uh, within a week after that happened, and they said, "Hey, you, we need your help. Can we come see you?" I go, "Yeah." So they come to us and they bring bring some of the controllers. They go, you got to help us and get these fixed. I said, first of all, it's not our company. It's it's a competitor of ours. And I'm not touching my competitor's project and tell you what they have to do to fix it. That's their fault. And the reason you bought it, because you it was, it was put in the contract by the city, that you have to have stuff that complies with UL regulations. And and you had to get the lowest bid. So they bought, they got what they did. The company never went out and got UL certified at all, ever. And Yeah. Uh, you know that's a yep. scary thing. That, that's a scary thing. And also controllers. Last thing on that subject, and I'm, I'm not trying to cut you off, just to fill that in, is that uh, there was also a gentleman who had a heart. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, put in his chest to, uh, to you know, helps it pump. Uh, I don't know, Defibrillator. It, yeah, or it's a little sensor they plug in under your skin, so it it makes sure you it's beating correctly and all that. Yeah. And he was, yeah, yeah, pacemaker. Sorry, I don't know why I couldn't think of the word, but he was standing next to his microwave in the house, and that that unit wasn't UL or FCC tested, and it interfered with his pacemaker, and he almost died. So, I mean, so there's some reasons why you don't want people touching things because if they replace something they don't know anything about, boom, it's not certified. So that that happens a lot. Now I know there's a lot goes on. I'll let you talk a little bit about maybe on the farm industry with tractors or something like that. I don't know yeah, if you've ever I, changed your oil in your car or changed your spark plugs. I mean, I don't know. I think that's yeah, a simple so, thing. Yeah. So Rob, we you know we've had a couple of occasions to talk about the right to repair issues on the on the show before and various aspects of it, but. You know, to me, it's when you, when you look back at why is there legislation, why are the states enacting legislation, whether it's in our industry or, or some other I- industry, right? And, and they do it out of, you know, exposure to litigation or safety issues and stuff, a couple of things that you've, you've already mentioned. But, um, you know, when you look at it, it's a, it's a policy that's put in, put in place, and it, and it affects lots of stuff. It affects established practices. Um, how the markets move, uh, innovation, technology, safety, you know, there's five of the top ones. There are, there are more yeah. than that, but, you know, that's what they really do, not just in our industry, but um, in others. Uh, I think for our industry, you kind of look at, we look at the EPA as being kind of, you know, the ringleader right. uh, on this on this sort of stuff because, the you know, the EPA has been, at, as you said, at the forefront of all of this stuff for, um, over a decade now, probably, and uh, specifically for us in in the irrigation industry, um, with the water sense regulations that they've come out. I mean, there's smart controllers, there's soil sensors, there's pressure regulating sprays, and and now we're looking at efficient nozzle technology, kind of kind of coming down the pike. So I think 
you know, I think somewhere there's uh, I've heard it I've heard it described before as an intersection, right? There's somewhere in this intersection where where there's uh, some way to limit the exposure to litigation, take care of the safety issues, um, take care of stuff that can affect um, you know proprietary information and and um, uh, manufacturers spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions and millions of dollars on on proprietary stuff to protect their their products. And then when you give everybody the same right to repair, even if even if it's a consumer or uh, you know small business contractors, um, whatever, all these companies are essentially exposing themselves to um, to people being able to figure out what those proprietary things are, right? Right. You know, it's like um, to me a valve. Okay, there's a couple things that can go wrong with a valve. A lot of times you get dirt in the uh, diaphragm. Or, or, the, or, as crazy it may sound, they put them in backwards. <laughs> not, not the, not the, man, not the uh, diaphragm, but the unit itself. The valve and, itself, yeah. yeah. Seen it a hundred times. Yeah, and, and and despite as you and I've talked about, there's arrows on the unit to say water comes in this way and goes out that way, and, they, and they, even big, big, big landscape companies uh, put them in backwards sometimes. But you know, I, I think there's some things that shouldn't be a problem. But but when it gets into the intellectual pro- properties, or if it's a safety yeah. concern, you know, l- let me ask your opinion. What about brakes on cars? Now, my kids went to yeah. high school where they took auto shop and they teach you how to change the brakes. Okay, yeah. so should that be done by somebody who's a professional, or somebody who's somebody went through a high school thing and or <laughs> followed somebody else and did it? I mean, what are you? Yeah. And then the brakes fail in the car because they put them in correct incorrectly. I mean, yeah. Where, where where do you put the the difference in that? Where do you put the, the the line? Yeah, I see that. I also see you know when you look at when you look at our industry, it's it's one thing, right? Because there's a lot of stuff coming down the pike, as as we said, that's 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 more and more regulation. And of course, we have we have a uh, an entity within the uh, irrigation industry that's watching all of this uh, yeah. stuff for us. The Irrigation Association, commonly known as the um, as the IA, but you know, it's not our industry is not the only one affected. I mean, it's been we've had we've had right to repair stuff in consumer electronics for a long, long time. For example, yep. that's that's one. Um, healthcare industry, right, is a um, uh, is another. Uh, so it's not just us that's affected by this. But you know, you again, like like you said, and I said, we've got to strike a balance somewhere. There's got to be some way uh, uh, to do it. You know, if you have a, a stereo system. That's a couple yeah. years old. It's out of water. Say it's five or even ten years old. They can last longer yeah. than that. But but it goes bad. The output doesn't work. Okay. So to me, right away, it's the output transistor or a diode. Something went wrong. So you bring it to a repair shop. Okay. And they fix it. They bring it back, and something happens, and it catches on fire or blows up. Well, whose responsibility is that? It's the and same same with getting a, a car fixed at a dealer by putting in new brakes or something, and they don't do something right, and you get in an accident because there's no brakes after a while. Um, you know, the risk is always there. And, and there was a state senator, I believe, um, what was it, in Indiana. And yeah, he, yeah. Put a, he proposed a, a key pro, uh, proponent of the bill, emphasized the statewide importance of security over individual agriculture opportunities. He's worrying about potential homeland security risks with exemptions. Yeah. You know, in, inside our controllers or even all our competitors, it's a very powerful microcontroller. It may cost three bucks, but... Just think how powerful that is versus 25 years ago when you had a whole room yeah. of a computer, and and all of these things can do all kinds of strange things. I mean, you, but but you'd have to know how it was programmed. You have to have the information, and and I can't see the competitors uh, of us are are, are you to say yes, we'll give out that information so everybody has, and they can go inside and you know rewrite a, a software program to operate the controller. That's not going to happen. That will that will yeah. not happen. But that it's it's. it's no. There's got to be a fair balance, and I don't know if they're, you know, because there was a group of farmers that sued John Deere recently. Oh yeah, and I don't sure. think the out, I don't think the outcome has happened, and, and I, I, I think I, it's still I, going on, right? I think yeah. it's still going on, and I'm 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 pretty sure that John Deere is doing everything they can to, you know, <laughs> kick that can along the road as far as they can. Yeah. I mean, you got complex 
Farming equipment is complex now. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. And you can't just have yeah. any, you know, Tom, Dick, Harry, or Ann go go working on it, right? There's training no. required and stuff like that. So, I mean, I can I can see changing the oil, changing some spark plugs. You know, some simple that isn't doesn't take a rocket science to do it. But but when you start messing with some of the electronics or how it controls the the machines and things, that that yeah. gets a little scary. <laughs> yeah, and those and, electronics are proprietary. That software is proprietary to that manufacturer, and they don't want people no. seeing what that is. No, not in the least. Right. Plus, and it I gives – oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, Rob, I was going to say real quick, I think I just make make a mention on that Indiana case that um, that, that you mentioned, because if, if my memory serves me right, that was, that was due in part to trying to keep – uh, foreign entities from um, owning a lot of agricultural land because there's a number of uh, foreign countries that do own large swaths of agricultural land in the United States. And, and I, you know, maybe some of them are, maybe it's okay to do that, but, you know, what do you think? Not for our adversarial uh, yeah. colleagues around the world, right? I mean, you know, China, Russia, for example, are the two biggies. Well, you, I'm sure you've been hearing the news in the last couple of years. China has bought lots of farm or potential farmland near military bases. Oh yeah, yeah. And only by most of them are by military bases. Why? Why does it have to be near that? Is yeah, there, yeah. Is there a reason for that? I mean, we we don't know. I mean, chips ICs are is a big deal with with the software yeah. part, part of it. I mean, the technology that's in those devices are very powerful. And um, you know, there's a lot of products that we can't, we're yeah. not allowed to sell overseas, and depending on yeah. what business you are, because of the, uh, the the part of cybersecurity. As you remember on the show that we had, even yeah, even going to a restaurant, it. even going to a restaurant, taking a picture of that Q code on the on the, on your table that gives you the menu, you don't know who put malware into that. And the next thing you know, they're seeing all your phone calls you're making, and you know, get your secrets out. So it, it, yeah, it's again, I think. Yeah, again, I think part of that Indiana, um, that House bill uh, that that's been introduced in Indiana is part and parcel of that is uh, is foreign entities owning this land near military bases or installations of um, yeah, yeah well, maybe, of, uh, homeland security. Well, maybe some of our listeners, if they have some comments about that, uh, give us a call or send us sure. an email, and we'd like to put that on and maybe have them on there and get their opinion. This is yeah. It's a it's a pretty interesting topic. I mean, you know, you know, you, at the first thing, you say, yeah, what's the big deal? Well, there is a big deal with it, and a lot of people don't understand the backstories to all of that. So, well, we're going to take a little break right now and uh, give our uh, one of our sponsors, which is Site One, a chance to say what they're doing, and then we'll be back with a really good uh, featured guest that we're very uh, happy to have. So, stick around for the second half of the Water Zone. We'll be right back. NBC News on KCAA Loma Linda, sponsored by Teamsters Local 1932, protecting the future of working families, Teamsters1932.org. Research shows you're about 10 times more likely to close a deal with an existing customer than a new one. And with water regulations on the rise, it's never been easier to upsell efficient irrigation systems to your customers. Upselling to your current customer base can provide them with the best products for their lawn while growing your business. This is the best time to seize this opportunity. We'll walk you through five ways to help you leverage water regulations to upsell to your customers. First, offer to audit your customer's systems. This can generate additional revenue through maintenance while offering the opportunity to discuss upgrades to their current systems. Additionally, offering audits can help strengthen your customer relationships in the long run. Next, talk to your customers about water regulations in your state. As laws around water regulations continually shift, it's important to keep them informed and their systems up to date. If their current systems don't comply with regulations, you can use the opportunity to sell them on more efficient systems. If your state isn't currently mandating water regulations, it could be in the future. You can set your customers and your business ahead of the curve by promoting efficient irrigation systems now. Next, communicate the benefits of smarter products to your customers. Recommend products that are easy to program and operate and simple to install. 
Wi-Fi based smart controllers, rain sensors, and weather stations can give your customers peace of mind knowing their systems auto-adjust watering schedules based on weather and soil conditions. Talk to your customers about how they can have a great looking lawn while saving water. PRS rotors and sprays can manage water pressure fluctuations and provide full coverage. Additionally, high performance nozzles and drip and micro irrigation can keep lawns healthy through high winds and drought. Promoting these products to your customers is another way to increase your revenue while keeping your customers' water bills down. Last, find a partner you can rely on. Site One is here to help your business thrive with smart, quality products, in-branch experts, and online resources. We're right here with you every step of the way. Site One can help you turn these regulations into opportunities to grow your business and boost your bottom line. Learn how you can take your business to the next level. Stop by Site One to talk with an in-branch expert or visit siteone.com slash savewater. Site One. Growth starts here. Well, okay, everybody. Welcome back to the second half of the radio show, Water Zone Radio Show program with Rob Starr and uh, your host here, Chris Davey. Thanks for sticking with us, everyone. We have a great guest here. It's a returning guest. Uh, been on the Water Zone before. His name is John Farner. He's a relatively familiar name if, for many of us in the uh, green industry, especially if you're associated with the Irrigation Association or with uh, Netafin. Um, John is now in a new role, uh, and Rob and I are, are very happy to have him back on the Water Zone today. He's a leading expert on water, land, and agriculture. And he's just recently been named the executive director of the Babbitt Center for Land and Water uh, Policy. John Farner, welcome to the Water Zone one more time. Chris, it's good to hear your voice. Can you guys hear me okay? Just doing a little yeah. on-the-spot spot check here. So. Welcome, na- welcome, neighbor. <laughs> I know. Now, you used, uh, it's in you used, your backyard in Arizona. It's great. Yeah, it used to be 3,000 miles. Now you're like 20 minutes down the road. So. Good. I'm glad your family's right. doing your family, your family's doing well. I, I talked I talked to you the other day. So, uh, welcome welcome to uh, sunny Arizona. It's good to hear you guys' voices again, and yours as well, John. So let's uh, let's get started for our listeners. Kind of um, you know a lot of our listeners I know are going to know uh, who you are, John, and and probably a lot of them familiar with you from the IA and from Netafin, but um, kind of. There's a gap in time there, buddy, between that and what you're doing now. So uh, why don't you take a minute, give our listeners the uh, the lowdown on what's been happening since um, since you left the IA. Yeah, so I, I, again, really appreciate you guys having me back on. It's always a pleasure to talk to you either in this setting or just personal settings, getting an opportunity to catch up over the past few weeks. Uh, also, before I start, Boy, am I glad I'm not working on right to repair stuff anymore, having focused only on land and water policy now. I don't ever you guys have to talk about it or deal with it on a policy level. It's quite complex, and I, I don't have any, envy anybody working on that issue these days. Yeah, so uh, a few years ago, uh, well, first of all, I have, I've had the fortunate opportunity to work uh, on water policy, specifically from the irrigation perspective, urban outdoor water use, agriculture water use, on, on the policy level for, for about 20 years now. Um, and I've had an even greater op- op- fortunate opportunity to having worked specifically for the irrigation industry uh, since 2008. And so I, uh, I feel like that is my home, my background, and one that I've really enjoyed getting to find folks like, like you and others throughout the industry. Uh, a couple of years ago, I, uh, I joined another manufacturer uh, working on very similar issues. Uh, on the sustainability side, really focusing on the agricultural side as Metafemos, their global team, uh, working on sustainability issues. While I was there, um, I, I was involved in some great discussions, great opportunities, really engaged at a global level at the United Nations, and really got to see some of the global discussions uh, that we're having relating to outdoor water use, to agricultural water use, to different land uses when it comes to agricultural production and green infrastructure. Uh, And then last year, I um, was recruited out of the blue to 
to talk about this unique opportunity that exists in Phoenix, Arizona, overseeing a portfolio of issues on behalf of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, uh, focusing on their water port- water and land conservation portfolio. And it's, uh, it's one that I'm really excited about. It's, it's one where I can engage now from a very high level and a very specific level, level for that matter, too, and honestly, without having to sell a product along with it, I, it, I get to engage with people like you, looking at best practices, looking at how land is used, how water is used. And it's, uh, it's been great. I've been here for about the past six months in the lower Colorado River Basin in the, in the heart of Arizona, right in Phoenix. So it's been, it's been a pleasure. So give, give our listeners a little uh, background about the Lincoln Institute and the Babbitt Center, if you would. Yeah, so the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy... Um, it's existed for almost 80 years now. Uh, it's a global organization based uh, outside of Boston in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's a global think tank focusing on the use of land, how to value land, uh, different best practices when it comes to land use planning, working with different levels of government, looking at, at policies that affect land use, whether it's infrastructure, green infrastructure, fiscal systems. Uh, you name it. Uh, back in 2017, um, and we have, when I say we're a global organization, the headquarters are in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We also have uh, a building here in Phoenix, Arizona. We have presence globally in Latin American Caribbean, China, Africa, and then also a building in Washington, D.C., office space in Washington, D.C., with, with, with global work in mind. In, uh, in 2017, our president, uh, and the chair of our board, Katie Lincoln, uh, were in the lower part of the Colorado River Basin, and we're really discussing in depth the water issues that are facing both the upper and lower Colorado River. And given the focus on land and the historic silos that municipalities and different levels of communities have faced uh, when, when managing land use and water use, what better way for the Lincoln Institute to invest in creating a specific initiative focusing on providing that level of support to communities in planning for both water use and land use, and that's how the Babbitt Center for Land and Water Policy was born back in 2017. That's awesome. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to surprise you a little bit, John, because I'm going to ask you a question about your sustainability role when you were at, at NetFM and how it relates to the <laughs> And how it relates to the industry. So don't worry, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to ask you to divulge uh, any secrets or anything like that. But John, yeah. we've seen other, we've seen other manufacturers, um, you know, Hunter, for example, Toro has a, a sustainability program yeah. um, as as well. That's become kind of a, yeah, that's become sort of a theme, John, if you will, right? And and major yeah. companies specifically hiring a uh, a sustainability manager. Um, you know, was you, was just. Uh, you know, to make it to make it a brief question for you, and not take too much time, was that a was that a good experience for you? Uh, it was a great experience, absolutely, and it's one where a lot of the work that I did and made a point of doing, really, in my opinion, while I worked for a manufacturer, it was on behalf of the industry, and I think we all understood that. So the work that Toro does, worth a hundred dollars, worth that Medicine does, the, on the sustainability side. You know, we want to elevate uh, the industry when it comes. We wanted to elevate the industry when it comes to uh, the umbrella of sustainability. And sustainability, in the minds of Medifim, uh, was really two main areas. Uh, one was looking inward. Uh, who are who were we as a company? Uh, how do we manufacture our products? Do we manufacture in a sustainable way. What is our energy footprint? Uh, are we sourcing plastics in a responsible way for manufacturing? Are we using recycled content? These are not trade secrets. These are these are initiatives that all of the manufacturers in the irrigation industry are going through. So that that's one area where if we're going to talk to talk, we needed to walk the walk as well. Uh, the other area was outward facing. So looking at the a market for agricultural products, looking at the market for uh, landscape products, and sustainability initiatives associated with that, and positioning the industry as part of a solution, not part of the problem. Um, and we can even talk about some of these issues that are going on in the Colorado River Basin. Now it's very uh, historic high water use uh, crops 
being grown in the basin, how do we grow these crops? How do we have, quote unquote, sustainable landscapes designed in a way uh, that do not waste water? Uh, and we do that through one of the tools in our arsenal is technology. You guys talked a little bit about it during the right yep. to repair presentation. We're talking about the level of sophistication when it goes into these technologies. And um, one one little anecdote that I've always talked about is if if the level of adoption for technology uh, in agriculture was taken at the same pace as the medicine industry, the physician industry, the hospital industry, number one, if, if the hospital industry took it at the level of agriculture, uh, our life expectancy would be way less. So we need to look at tools and opportunities to encourage technology adoption as part of solution before we have a nuclear option of converting crops, converting land, following land. We need to exhaust all opportunities to provide the tools necessary for farmers to grow crops in a sustainable way without wasting our natural resources. In my opinion, both personally and professionally, given my experience and research, we have not done that yet. So uh, we did that a lot at Medifim. We talked a lot about, about that. We talked a lot about ecosystem service benefits. In addition to water use savings, there is a carbon savings associated as well. When looking at water use, there is an energy savings as well when looking at how water is used. And we need to take that now to the policy level with looking at how this, these technologies are being adopted on the ground, both urban as well as in the agricultural uh, water use area. Uh, John, a great summary. I mean, just uh, just terrific there, and I and I appreciate it. And I want to get into talking a little bit more about uh, the Colorado River Basin, um, focusing on that as you mentioned. But but listen, you know, Rob and I were talking a couple of weeks ago, and and we were talking about just how just a few years ago, you know, five ten years ago, there was an occasional news story about water, right? You heard it, and and kind of yep. got a little bit of publicity and all that stuff. But now now, John, I mean. These days, right? Water is the news. I mean, it is every single yeah. day. There's, yeah. there's there's something about that. Um, and so, what what you're doing, or what opportunities do you have to all these things you have to work on? I mean, the door is wide open for you, John. Do you agree? Yeah, I do, and I and I appreciate that perspective uh, because it's it's extremely true. Uh, you can't open up the New York Times without reading about some sort of water challenge facing a given area in the United States. Uh, last year, there was a big portfolio regarding Colorado River Basin. They've done others on groundwater use. They've done some on water quality issues facing some underserved communities. Um, that's not only in the United States, Chris and Rob, that's also global. And you look sure. at, as, as recent as last year, in early of 2023, the United Nations held a water conference. Now, this is the first ever water conference that the United Nations has held since 1977. That is the same year Star Wars was in the movie theater as a first-run feature. And so for more than 40 years, they had not had a global discussion on water, and now they do. And, oh, by the way, they're not waiting another 40 years. The next one is going to be in 2026. And so I think that if you look at everyone has an agenda, the United Nations has an agenda, news outlets has an agenda, but this agenda is driven by interest at the local level as well as a governmental level as well on the impact of water use in our daily lives. And it just goes to show the importance of viewing water as uh, the important natural resource as it is. John, let me, let me ask you a question. I you were talking about agriculture a little while ago with Chris. Um, have you studied or, or get involved with what's called vertical farming? where it's, it's in like a, a manufactured building, a warehouse, and everything's done yeah. internally. What, what do you think of that? Because mm -hmm. I know there's several places across the country that are doing it. They're growing vegetables, and they have a, a yep. nice business of that. Do you think that's going to be the, the wave of the future? Because you use less water, less you know, pesticides. They use artificial light, LED lights. Uh, they control the temperature so you don't have to use as much mm -hmm. water. What, what, do you, what do you think of that as a future? Um, so there are a few, um, I guess, projects globally where we're seeing this pop up. Uh, some in the United States, I believe New Jersey has a couple. Um, and now everything you just talked about, Rob, takes, takes a lot of energy. 
And uh, it, 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 the cost of vertical farming at this point in time, pretty expensive. And if you have high value crops that can pay for that expense associated with, with vertical farming, great. Uh, I believe that as technology continues to evolve and we adopt this technology, whether it's in a standard agricultural setting uh, out in the open, undercover, or in vertical farming, each one of those aspects are going to get more and more efficient. And so I think it's very premature for anybody to have an opinion on vertical farming right now because we have seen promise. We've also seen challenges. Nobody has a direct answer to address every single challenge that vertical farming has. But there's enough promise there where I see a lot of investment occurring both domestic and globally and how we can continue that. And, hey, looking for a use of land uh, per output of yield, we're seeing that that is being very efficient uh, with, with the amount of output per, per unit of land that's associated with that output. So it's something that I think we should continue to be looking at. I think it's very premature to make a, a definitive answer one way or another on the role that will play in our global food production looking forward. Good thought. Good thought um, on that. Yeah. So, listen. If um, if if, uh, if you get a chance, listen to uh, last week's Water Zone, John. We had uh, a guy named Thomas Schumann on there. He is the uh, the guy that heads up Thomas Schumann Capital. He's got two projects going: Project Greenland and Project Alaska. He's within months of making a maiden voyage of getting um, pure, pure, pristine glacier water from Greenland and Alaska and shipping it to arid regions uh, of the world where water scarcity is a real uh, issue. It was just last week on the, on last week's. It's up on, wow. the, up on the website now. <laughs> too. So, I mean, very interesting conversation. Just, uh, you know, just to plug that one, uh, what, one more yeah. time for that. Well, there's also, uh, also, yeah, there's, also yeah. there's also a group called the water, uh, the water train that we had on several years ago. Chris and I were laughing yeah, yeah. Uh, when we, when we had it, we have a little, Whistle that sounds just like a, a steam engine uh, that we use for the show. But but he bought originally this company, a thirty-two uh, tanker rail cars. R- yeah, tanker rail cars, and was hauling water all across the country to stuff. And I've, from what I've heard, I haven't uh, followed back up on them. It's been about five six years. Uh, they uh, assuming uh, they followed their their path, and from what I hear, they've like quadrupled their business in moving water from. East Coast, the West Coast, the North, the South, and uh, they even they even wanted to do um, uh, what was the lake in in, uh, in California, Chris, uh, that dried up. It's in uh, San Bernardino County. Salt and Sea. So Salt and Sea. They wanted to refill Salt and Sea see with that process. Right. Can't imagine wow, how many part- cars that would take to to move that yeah. water, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. See part of the Colorado River Basin. So maybe let's uh, let's give you a chance, John, to focus in on the Colorado River Basin. I know that it's important to you. Can, kind of give us the history. What is the Colorado River Basin? Why is it so important? Yeah, so the Colorado River Basin is made up of two components, upper and lower uh, basin states. Uh, the one that you'll mainly recognize uh, as being part of the Colorado River Basin that faces water challenges on a regular basis from the upper portion. You have States like Utah uh, and Colorado, uh, and then the lower you have uh, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, as well as Southern California. And each one of these states, along with the tribal nations that uh, that exist within those states, have a right to the Colorado River, as well as Mexico, too. And this was all uh, divvied up, so to speak, uh, back when the West was settled and created with the territories, and has been the law of the land ever since. So these are states that are uh, prior appropriated states, the first in time, first in right, as you guys know, and maybe your listeners know or not, but the way water rights work is that it's all based on time. So water itself is its own separate entity. If you own land in a state, the surface water that goes through that land, you may not have a right to. That's a separate property that you will then need to buy from that property holder of uh, that, that water, that right holder of the water. And so, and different states have uh, first in time, first in rights differently. In Colorado, agriculture has senior water rights. In Arizona, cities have senior water rights. So it's really complex when it comes down into the Colorado River. Now, as the West continues to be more and more settled and more and more pressure is 
such on the water resources, the demand for the Colorado River is significantly outpacing its supply. This is based on data provided by the United States Geologic Service, the Department of Interior of the United States. It's data that is also supported by the individual states that are within the Colorado River Basin. And it's, it's very difficult to allot uh, or to provide those uh, entities that have the water rights, the amount of water they have a right to because of the lack of supply. So one of the biggest things that we are looking to do is relieve the stress that's placed on that water supply. And that's really where a lot of the political and policy discussions are occurring right now. What can cities do? What can agriculture do? How can we jointly engage with the tribal nations and, and indigenous populations that hold 25% of the water right to the Colorado River Basin? And how do we engage them at a very thoughtful and respectful level to bring them to the table that is good for both the tribal nations and those states where the tribal nations occur? And it's, it's like negotiating with a completely different country, in some cases, based on law. So the Colorado River has a history of uh, the, the importance of water in the Colorado River Basin has always been quite large. Always, it's always had water's always played a major role within the basin state, given the amount of rainfall that occurs and, and its reliance on surface water. But as the West continues to grow in size, as we continue to depend more on agriculture and crops grown in the Colorado River Basin, that water supply is strained more and more and more. So this is where we at the Lincoln Institute and the Babbitt Center come in and provide a nonpartisan way of thinking about how to address these challenges that are facing the Colorado River Basin state. What in the beginning, I guess I'm begging, I'm thinking of a question here, here John, in the, in the beginning of uh, this, what was the impetus that got, or maybe, maybe the question is why uh, did the Babbitt Center start to work on this? I mean, what got you involved in it? Yeah, and, and this is something where uh, it, 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 it was kind of visionary, right? Uh, and uh, it, it, we, are, we are named after Bruce Abbott, the former governor of Arizona and former secretary of the interior under the Clinton administration. Bruce was actually a member of the board of the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and uh, in, for the recognition of his work on water issues, whether you're agreeing with his politics or not, it is named after, after Bruce, after Secretary Abbott. Now, He's not involved in policy setting, is not involved with our inner workings whatsoever, but it just want to kind of relay that message regarding the name of the Babbitt Center itself. Now, with with our work in the lower part of the Basin State, specifically in Phoenix, Arizona, and our expertise in the Lincoln Institute on land use planning, we saw as an institute the need to bring water into land use planning and vice versa, bring land use planning into water. We've seen it in Arizona. We've seen it in Colorado. We've seen it all over the United States where a developer comes in, purchases land, and tries to figure out the water source later. That cannot happen. We need to think about both at the exact same time because they are both very important. As we mm. look at how to use land, where to put infrastructure, the thought about water, not only the water source, but how the water is going to be used needs to be put into place as well. So this is where the creation of the Babbitt Center took that expertise we had on the land side and built the expertise on the water side to really marry the two together to provide solutions to communities from that perspective. I think for the I think we should also let our listeners know about the apportionment of of the uh, of the territory. I mean I, if, I, if I'm correct there's like four upper basin states with Colorado, Wyoming, yep. Utah, and New Mexico and then correct. there's three lower correct. ones which are Nevada, Arizona, and California. And, you know, they're still negotiating. I know California is sort of a holdout. They say they agree, but then they, they don't agree, and then the Indian tribes have a, <laughs> yeah. an issue with that. Do you ever think that's going to – I know they always say, you know, whiskey, uh, you know, is for fighting and water or whatever, whatever that term is. I forget. Well, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the old Mark Twain adage that I have no idea. If you, there's a lot of things attributed to Mark Twain that I'm not sure really should be. And so this yeah. is one of them. <laughs> where, uh, yeah, where – Whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. And, yeah. and this, is, this is a situation where I try not to overuse that, that adage, Rob, but it, this is one where 
water is still important to our livelihood on so many yeah. levels, economic, yeah. social, environmental. It's important to all three. And those are the three key pillars of sustainability. And yeah. water is a finite resource. And it, it, you know, I, you brought up these uh, kind of different solutions that people are bringing to the table. And I'll include desalination in one of them, too, where mm-hmm. in San Diego, there is a full desalination plant. In Israel, there's a lot of desalination going on. Now, the energy used and the environmental impact of desalination is still in question on whether that is worth the investment or not. And how do you get rid of how do you get rid of the brine and all of that? I mean, that's that's a big big deal. Exactly, and what and what that's that's exactly right. And so, with all these things in mind, right, one thing remains constant: that we need to use our water resources. We we should not waste our water resources. And whether or not we have these other solutions of bringing in water from other areas, we still need to treat the water with respect. Now. When it comes to the discussions that are occurring among states, among tribal nations, even at a, an international level with Mexico, it can get pretty testy. It can get pretty testy because people are saying, well, we're doing our part. Why aren't you doing your part? I will say that overall, the discussions are, have been very cordial. They've been cordial among the tribal nations. They've been cordial, cordial among states. We've gotten through some major agreements over the past couple of years throughout the Colorado River Basin state. And so we will continue to make process as the strand of the Colorado River occurs right. because every everybody within the basin can agree that it's an important issue that we need to come together and solve. Well, you've given us a great definition of what of the issues facing the Colorado uh, basin. So in your opinion, you know, kind of kind of if you can tell us and our listeners what are what are the top two or three biggest challenges that uh, that the Colorado River face, uh, Basin is facing. Yeah, so if you look at where the water is used, right, agriculture is one of them. And I mentioned this early on in my comments, talking about sort of the more along the lines of sustainability and where opportunities occur. Uh, and alfalfa has a big target on its back right now on whether we should have even growing alfalfa within yeah. the Colorado River Basin. So this is, of yeah. course, an area where we need to provide expertise and some leadership on it because a lot of opinions right now on either side need to be based more on science and not on opinion and opportunities. What is the economic impact of alfalfa? What is, why do we grow, grow so much alfalfa in the United States? Are there ways to grow alfalfa that are lower water use than what is being done right now? Let's talk about that first, and then we can make decisions on what the best use of that agricultural land is. And you guys mentioned uh, earlier about foreign entities purchasing agricultural land. Well, a lot of that specific crop is shipped overseas. So working with the United States Trade Representative on what exactly best practices are to ship a high high water use crop overseas, because it's like shipping a natural resource overseas. That, 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 That is one of the biggest challenges we have. Two is education. We need to educate communities on different sizes, different scopes, different levels on the importance of land and water use planning. What role does efficiency play? What role does landscape planning play within the community? Uh, you know, right plant, right place. And what are yeah. best practices used at the utility level and community level to encourage best water pra- watering practices uh, when it comes to that, that perspective? So that's another big challenge we have as well. And then manufacturing. In Arizona, Rob, you, you, I'm sure you've seen it. There's a lot of semiconductor plants yep. being uh, built right now in Arizona, uh, they thrive on low humidity uh, for the clean rooms of manufacturing semiconductors and microchips, but they're high, they're water intensive in terms of the cleaning necessary associated yep. with manufacturing, but it's very economically beneficial. So <clears throat> where do we, what is that balance uh, with, with that coming into the Colorado River Basin State as well? I know California deals with the alfalfa, which is sent over to the uh, Middle East. Uh, a lot of people from yeah. there buy that, and then you also have the nuts that are grown in California that, yeah. uh, that, that exactly yeah, yeah exactly that, right. that are over there. And you know, and 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 now they're talking about, or it's been proposed, uh, you know, that they should get rid of cows for the flagellants and get that out of the state. So, yeah. it, you yeah. know, with more people coming into this world, we got to have food, and and you can't have food well, then, yeah. without water. I mean, Chris and I at the end of our show always say, hey, if you like green, you know, we always well, help keep our planet blue. But if you like green, you got to have blue. There's, there's no, there's no yeah. doubt about that. Yeah. And and uh, exactly. I don't think the people are are as educated as they are, such as such as countries like Israel, 
when people really have the understanding of the importance of the value, the true value of water. You know, people here go to the gas station and they fill their car up and they see immediately how much it costs. Instantaneously, they look, they look at the pump and see. But on your water bills, you don't know until the end of the month. And then, oops, it's too late. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. And so we need to we need to look at that perspective uh, with that with those thoughts in mind, Rob, and and seek opportunities to have the least environmental impact as possible through yeah. agricultural production, through community planning, through everything else. Knowing is that the water used in these areas is a beneficial use of water. But we need to treat that water with the utmost respect and the land for which we are practicing these, uh, you know, agriculture, growing agriculture commodities or community development. We need to look at land with that same type of thought in mind. Yep. Let's do a quick yep. focus on uh, the Babbitt Center for a second. So what, what's next for you? I mean, what, uh, what kind of challenges is the yeah. other than the Colorado yeah, River? I, what else is going on? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. We're going to continue doing what we do with working communities and agriculture producers of the Colorado River Basin. We built a level of expertise on that in 2017. So we're going to see what we can do with helping communities that are facing similar challenges beyond the Colorado River Basin, both nationally and internationally, looking to engage with partners on how we can take these lessons learned that we've talked about right now and provide solutions uh, to those areas throughout the world. Uh, the same way we're doing so throughout the Lincoln. One of our uh, sponsors, which is Conical Phillips, they're getting in, uh, they are into the water business of reproducing water, turning dirty water into clean water. So that's going to be a yeah. big project for them. So, uh, absolutely, that's great. Good to them for that. We need more. We need more innovation like that occurring. Yep. Yeah. Tell some. Tell some of our listeners how they can get more information. I know the Babbitt Center and Lincoln Institute. There's there's a magazine that you do and. And you do books yeah, and papers and stuff like that? Yeah, a- a- absolutely. So the main, the main mothership website we have is Lincoln, spelled like the president, L-I-N-C-O-L-N, I-N-S-T, so Lincoln Inc. at uh, uh, .edu. So Lincoln Inc. Uh, we also just go to a data center, QDs, QDs, well, freebies, QDs, uh, uh, .org. Either one of those will take you to our education, our research, our initiative to the story map of the Colorado River Basin uh, to the final point of the Excellent, excellent. Oh, hey, as always, you are a pleasure to talk to. Uh, we miss you a lot. I'm glad, glad you're now closer, closer to Chris, real close to me, so that's a good thing. Uh, you've always, yeah, been yeah. A, always been a great guy and, and uh, a very, very senior professional with great ethics, and I do appreciate working with you all these years. So. Congratulations. Uh, hi, how many years have you been doing this show now, Rob? Nine, ten, almost ten years, yeah. Almost ten. Good for you. Congratulations. That's yeah. great. So, but, it, but it's only made, made uh, successful for having people like you on the show. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, thanks John, and uh, thank you very much, and we appreciate you being on the show. All right. Good luck, guys. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. You too, John. Take care, buddy. Okay, for our listeners, the most important thing that we want to tell you, one, is thanks for joining us, but, but try to please help keep our planet, planet blue. Blue, because if you like blue or you like green, you've got to have blue. Thanks for sticking with us, everybody. We'll see you next week. Yes, let's do it again. Bye-bye.